Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Great to see everyone coming out on such a fine Saturday afternoon. And you could be tending to your gardens or mowing the lawn or doing those, those myriad of important things. But instead, you've chosen to spend some time with us discussing and listening to arguments of a very important issue. So I thank you for that. Uh, my name is Gary Porter. I'm the executive director of the Constitution Leadership Initiative, the sponsor of this event, and uh, hopefully the sponsor of other events. Uh, and on, on that note, uh, there are two clipboards going around. If you would like to be informed of other events such as this, uh, please give me your name and email address, and I'll make sure you get notified. Our objective in the Constitutional Leadership Initiative is to help inform and improve the understanding of the U.S. Constitution among the general public. So whatever kind of events will further that goal, uh, we are all over them. I believe it's beyond dispute that the federal government long ago surpassed the limited design envisioned by the founders. In 2010, former California Congressman Peter Stark was quoted at a town hall meeting saying, the federal government, yes, can do most anything in this country. Compare that view with James Madison, who in the Virginia Ratifying Convention of 1788 said the powers of the federal government are enumerated, it can only operate in certain cases, it has legislative powers on defined and limited objects beyond which it cannot extend its jurisdiction. When we consider that our country is $17 trillion in debt, with little sign that Congress is interested in changing the accumulation of that debt, let alone paying any of it off, when we consider that the President is carrying out his threat to govern by executive order, even with the aid of uh, members of Congress, and that his selective enforcement of dutifully passed laws goes essentially unchallenged, when we consider that over the last 80 years the Supreme Court has rendered the Interstate Commerce Clause uh, into a blank check for Congress to regulate anything having a connection with the word commerce, and in uh, National Federation of Independent Business versus Sibelius, otherwise known as the Obamacare decision, declared that Congress's taxing authority is virtually unlimited. And add to this that the American people appear more interested in who is this season's American Idol than they are in what does the Constitution say. I think you can all agree that it is time for some sort of action. The proposal being debated today is as follows. Resolved that, the con that a convention of the states convened by Congress under Article 5 of the U.S. Constitution is the best means of restraining an overpowerful federal government. Article 5 of the U.S. Constitution describes two mechanisms for amending the document. And to save our debaters precious time, I will recite Article 5 for them. The Congress, whenever two-thirds of both houses shall deem it necessary, shall propose amendments to this Constitution or on the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the several states, shall call a convention for proposing amendments, which, in either case, shall be valid to all intents and purposes also as part of this Constitution, when ratified by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states, or by conventions in three-fourths thereof, as the one or the other mode of ratification may be proposed by the Congress provided that no amendment which, shall, which may be made prior to the year 1808 shall in any manner affect the first and fourth clauses in the ninth section of the first article, and that no state without its consent shall be deprived of its equal suffrage in the Senate. Today's debate is somewhat unusual in that instead of debate teams uh, consisting of three speakers each, which is the standard, we have single speakers speaking on each side. And our one-hour time limit is a little unusual as well. Uh, it will force both debaters to limit their arguments to just the essentials. Uh, each side will be allotted initial 15 minutes to present their opening statement. Then we will have 10-minute rebuttal sessions by each uh, speaker and finish up with five-minute closing arguments by each side. When my trusty kitchen timer goes ding, uh, the speaker at the time will be allowed to finish whatever sentence he was embarked on at that moment, provided it not, does not become something like a congressman would uh, end up with, uh, with run-on and additional clauses. If time permits, at the conclusion of the formal debate, we will open up the floor to questions of both speakers. Although the library does require that we vacate the premises at 445 with everything back in the place the way I found it. So, 
uh, our time is limited. I will ask the audience to please refrain from any audible signs of support for either speaker during the debate. Lastly, uh, we have enlisted the help of Mrs. Dana Miter in the back, who is currently assisting with York High School in setting up a debate club. And uh, she has considerable debate experience. So she's going to be our unofficial judge for the day. And at the end, I will ask her to give us, uh, from a technical standpoint at least, what, uh, what her reflections on the debate were. So uh, speaking in the affirmative today is Mr. Robert Kelly. Mr. Kelly from Brown Hill, Virginia, is the Virginia Staff Counsel for the Citizens of Self-Governance Convention of the States Project. And speaking in the negative is Mr. Jeff Lewis of New Bern, North Carolina. Jeff is the founder of Patriot Watchdog, co-founder and national director of the Patriot Coalition, and national director of the Federal Immigration Reform and Enforcement Coalition. So without further ado, Mr. Kelly. short notice. I look forward to a lively debate with you. And thank you all for coming out. I think this is a hugely important issue and it's incredibly timely. The organization I work for, the Convention of States Project, has just launched a nationwide grassroots campaign to use Article 5 of the Constitution to rein in the power of our runaway federal government. So this is an incredibly timely issue. It's an incredibly timely issue not just because we're trying to make a strong effort right now, but also because the federal government has gift-wrapped us a present with the implosion of the Obamacare program. When the government can't even run a website correctly, you have a lot of people really beginning to question how far can the government go before its size makes it just too big to handle even basic fundamental tasks. And that's really what this debate is about. What is the most effective way to limit the power of the federal government? And I want to say, regardless of whether you agree with me or you agree with Mr. Lewis at the end of this debate, I would encourage you not just to leave the issue here. Please go home, read more about this issue. Our website, conventionofstates.com, has a number of resources. Um, as Gary mentioned, this is a very short debate that we have here today. It's only an hour, and we're only going to be able to scratch the surface of what is a very, very deep and very, very nuanced issue. So I'd encourage you, please go home, read more about this issue, and please get involved. Okay, this is a hugely important political issue. Don't just go home and read about this. Go home and take action. Get involved. Again, our website has a wonderful way for you to get involved directly with our grassroots network that we're building. But if you oppose this, I would encourage you to get involved on the other side. But don't be silent. Be involved in this debate and be engaged as active citizens looking out for the best interests of this country. So with that, this debate really boils down to a simple question. Do we trust the Constitution, the whole Constitution, as written by the founders, or do we not? Do we doubt part of it? Do we doubt what's in Article 5 of the Constitution? My organization, the Convention of States Project, and I personally stand for the proposition that we can trust everything the founders gave us in the Constitution, up to and including the provisions that they put in Article 5. We do not need to be afraid of the powers that our own Constitution gives us as citizens. Mr. Lewis, on the other hand, stands for the proposition that we can't trust ourselves to use Article 5. We can't trust what the founders put in Article 5 of the Constitution. We should only use part of the Constitution. And I believe that's a flawed approach to our Constitution. So Gary mentioned really briefly there some of the problems we have with our federal government right now. I just want to add a few more statistics on top of that just to show you the gravity and the depth of the situation we're in. I believe Gary mentioned that the national debt right now is $17 trillion. That's the official figure. Officially, our debt is $17 trillion. That doesn't talk about the billions and trillions of dollars we have invested Social Security and Medicare benefits that are outlaid right now. These are debts that the government presently has. When you factor those in, our debt is estimated at somewhere between $100 and $200 trillion. That's trillion with a T, trillion dollars. That's a huge debt. That's an amazingly large debt. Uh, one organization calculated the, the net assets of all of the uh, household goods in America, all of the uh, property essentially owned by households and by businesses, whether large or small, 
and it calculated that that number came out to just over $100 trillion. So if our national liabilities are $100 to $200 trillion, that means that even if every individual, every household, and every business in America sold off every asset that they had, they would barely be able to pay off the debt as it stands today. That's a huge problem, and it needs a solution that can address that problem. One thing that I don't believe Gary did mention was our gigantic federal bureaucracy. We have a bunch of unelected bureaucrats up in Washington, D.C. who pass laws on a regular basis. They're binding just as though Congress, our elected representatives, have passed them. But they are passed by unelected bureaucrats. I took a look at the statistics on this. In 1998 was the last time the federal government actually bothered to count this. So that's 16 years ago was the last time they counted it. They determined that there were 134,723 pages in the Code of Federal Regulations in 201 volumes. If you stack those on top of each other, it would be 19 feet high, which just for reference, this ceiling's a little bit under that. So if you stacked the regulations that are currently active, and this was 16 years ago in 1998, it would reach the ceiling and a couple feet more. That's crazy. And if you just want to look at it another way, uh, in 2012, those bureaucrats passed a new regulation, not replacing an old one, but a new regulation every three hours and 17 minutes, which is, incidentally, less time than it's going to take me to drive home after this debate today. That's how bad the problem is. And of course, that doesn't go into Obamacare. That doesn't go into the National Security Administration. That doesn't go into all of the executive orders that are coming out of the presidency. Now, why do I talk about this? Why do I belabor the point on the problem here? And it's basically this, if we don't understand the gravity of the problem, we're not going to prescribe the right solution. If we don't understand how serious the problem is in the federal government, we're not going to prescribe the right solution. So what is the problem? I want to submit to you that our problem is not particular politicians. Our problem is not John Boehner. Our problem is not President Obama. Our problem is not Chief Justice John Roberts or any other single politician you can name. Our problem is not with particular politicians. How do, how do we know this? Well, we know this because no matter who's in power, whether it's Republicans or Democrats, or even if it were Libertarians, no matter who's in power in Washington, D.C., we get the same results. It doesn't matter if George Bush is president. It doesn't matter if Obama's president. In either case, the federal government continues to get larger and larger. And that indicates that what we have in Washington, D.C. is not a people problem. It's not a personnel problem. It's a structural problem. And if we look at what the founders intended our government to look like, that becomes abundantly clear. If you ask the founders what was the single most important feature of American democracy, in fact, we don't have to speculate about this, they told us in Federalist Number 10, the single most important feature of American democracy was the balance of power. They divided power between three branches of the federal government, and they divided it between the federal government and the state governments. In essence, what they did is they created a horizontal axis where power is balanced. We have three branches of government, Congress, the judiciary, and the president. But most of the founders would have said at least as important, and perhaps even more important, is this vertical balance of power between the federal government and the state governments. The federal government and the state governments were supposed to be in continual comp competition for power to ensure that neither government obtained too much power. But what do we have today? We don't have any competition. The state governments have almost no power anymore. The federal government has claimed it all. Now this might be, this might surprise some of you, but none of this would have surprised the founders. None of this would have surprised the founders. And the reason we know none of this would have surprised the founders is because they talked about this exact scenario. If we go all the way back to 1787, September 15th at the Constitutional Convention, which was meeting in Independence Hall in Philadelphia, they talked about this exact issue. September 15th was just two days before they signed the document. So they're getting down to the wire here. They're at the very end. They're doing their final proofreading, their final edits to the Constitution. They get to Article 5, so they're almost at the very end of the document. And George Mason points out that there's a huge problem with Article 5, because Article 5 lays out the ways that the Constitution can be amended. And what he pointed out was, under the way they had drafted it, only Congress could propose amendments to the Constitution. And as George Mason put it, what happens if Congress is the problem? What happens if Congress is the problem? If only Congress can propose amendments to the Constitution, then what's going to happen is that every amendment that's passed is only going to give more power to Congress. And slowly but surely, this balance of power 
is going to get out of whack, and there's going to be no way to reverse it, because Congress is the only body that can amend the Constitution. So what he proposed, what the founders got together and proposed, was that the states be allowed to amend the Constitution too, and completely bypass Congress. And that's what they did. They allowed three, two-thirds, excuse me, two-thirds of the states, just like two-thirds of Congress can propose amendments, two-thirds of the states can propose amendments to the Constitution via a convention. Now, that makes sense if you think about the fact that Congress is basically a sitting constitutional convention. Congress can propose amendments to the Constitution anytime it wants by a two-thirds vote. The states have the same power to hold a convention and propose amendments. So how does that process work? How did they lay it out? It's important to understand that amending the Constitution happens in two phases. There's proposal and there's ratification. And a lot of the arguments, and I, I suspect a lot of the things Mr. Lewis is going to say to argue against using Article 5, come from confusing these two steps and ignoring the fact that there are two separate steps. Proposal and ratification. All Congress can do is propose amendments. All a convention of states can do is propose amendments. Those amendments, whether they come from Congress, whether they come from a convention of states, have to go back to the states to be ratified before they become law, before they become a part of the Constitution. And the founders realized how important this was that they put a strong check on the ability to amend the Constitution. They required that three quarters of the states, that's 38 states. That means one state house in 13 states can block any proposed amendments from becoming part of the Constitution. That is the ultimate check that the founders put in place. The founders knew they were giving the states a strong tool when they allowed them to propose amendments to the Constitution. So they put checks and balances just like they did on every other part of our government. They didn't just suddenly forget about checks and balances when they got to Article 5. They put them in the document there, too. So that's how Article 5 works, and it's important that we understand that, that there is a hugely important check there to ensure that amendments, that crazy amendments, don't occur to the Constitution. So with that, now maybe you don't think that just following the Founders' advice is enough evidence to support an Article 5 convention. I mean, this was the proposal that they put forward for the situation where the federal government got out of control. But even if we don't trust the Founders based on that, let me give you a sort of realpolitik reason to support Article 5. If we look at practical political realities, there's a very strong reason to support Article 5. And that's the fact that the states are substantially more conservative and more friendly to small government than the federal government is. It's been that way through most of American history, and it's that way today. States are substantially more conservative, and they're substantially more friendly to small government. And that should, be in, that should intuitively make sense. The states are inherently more local. They're inherently more responsive to the people. State representatives represent less people than the representatives do up in the federal government. So we have a strategic advantage as the enemies of big government, as the friends of small government in the states. And yet for the longest time, we've been trying to limit the government by marching on Washington, D.C. And all we're doing by doing that, even if we get small victories, all we're doing is focusing more attention, more money, more effort, more energy on Washington, D.C. And that's just increasing Washington, D.C.'s power. I mean, today, you ask just about anybody, and they don't know what's going on in their state legislature. They just care about Washington, D.C. They care about the presidential election, but they don't care about their governor's race. They care about their race for their Congress, but they don't care about their state delegate race. That's a problem. And that's a problem we've played into as the friends of limited government by going to Washington, D.C. and fighting our battles there. What we should be doing is fighting our battles in the states. We should be emphasizing the power that the states have under the Constitution. And that's the beauty of Article 5. It empowers the states. It goes completely around Congress. The whole point of it was to give the states back power when the federal government overstepped. And that's exactly what we have today. This is the prescription that the founders gave us for this exact scenario. So in closing, let me just say that I'm open to other solutions. I'm open to other solutions. If Mr. Lewis can show a solution, can give me a solution that addresses the right problem, the structural imbalance of power, that is less risky than using Article 5, and is more effective at fixing the problem, 
then I will gladly jump on board with his project. I'll do it in a heartbeat. Now, I don't think that's likely because I think the founders knew what they were doing when they gave us Article 5, and I think their solution is a pretty darn good one. But if he can prove that, I'll gladly jump on board with him. I would submit that those are the criteria you should use to judge whether you're going to support a convention of states. Is there a more effective solution that addresses the right problem, is less risky, and will actually fix the problem? Article 5 does it. It addresses the right problem. It's the exact solution the founders gave us for this exact scenario. The founders realized it was powerful, it was a very powerful tool, so they put checks and balances on its use. Foremost among them, ratification by 38 states, which is a huge check on its use. Will it be effective? That depends on the American people, but it certainly can be. Amendments to the Constitution, limiting the power of the General Welfare Clause, limiting the power of the Com Commerce Clause, those will have a huge effect on the bureaucracy, on the spending of the federal government. And that's, that's why I believe that our country can be turned around from its present course. And that's why I believe Article 5 is critical to that turnaround. And that's why I would encourage you to support an Article 5 convention. see it from here, but my cards are on the back table. Do you see the blue card? The little blue emblem? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That comes off the Victory Monument. Uh, the Victory Monument stands as a testament uh, to the struggles for liberty. It took, uh, from the time it was commissioned, it took them a hundred years to, to actually get it built. But they did eventually accomplish that. Uh, I tell our national leadership that at some point they need to make a pilgrimage to Yorktown and to the Victory Monument. Because not only can liberty be secured and defended, it has been done before. And fortunately, the framers left us a document uh, to preserve the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Around 2,500 years ago, y'all have heard of Confucius, right? Confucius said, when words lose their meaning, people lose their freedom. If you had or are receiving what is called a public education in America today, you're handicapped and disadvantaged by design. Our government and education system is no longer designed to teach you how to think or teach you, teach you to think, but rather what to think. Constitution no longer means what it meant when it was ratified. Legislators attempting to protect our First and Second Amendment rights have introduced and passed legislation this, this year that includes <coughs> phrases referencing the intent of the Constitution as it was understood at the time they joined the Union. Yet these states were not among the original 13, but states which joined the Union 50 to 100 years later, as if the meaning somehow changed. Now, <coughs> principles of liberty in our founding documents are barely mentioned in school, let alone taught. If you don't know what your rights are, how can you possibly know when they're being stepped on? I grew up wondering what happened to the German people in not, that led up to Nazi Germany. And they, they had a constitutional democracy they were cultured, well-educated, very industrious. What happened? The gentleman wrote a book in the early 70s, was researching this, and talked to some survivors of Nazi Germany. And much like the Pastor Niemöller quote about when they came for the trade unionist, I didn't say anything because I wasn't in the union, and so forth. And he, he rattled off the list of people they came for, and he sat on his hands. And I agree with Mr. Kelly that regardless of whether you believe we should defend or amend the Constitution, give it some serious thought 
and don't, don't just take my word for it or his as to what, what the solution should be. It's no matter what issue you're fighting or defending, our constitutional republic is the foundation of that. Uh, we have to defend, not amend. And we're not opposed to amending the Constitution. It's certainly not opposed to Article 5. But there's a time and a place for everything. I think we should try upholding the Constitution before we start tinker, tinkering on it. Under the ancient, ancient concept of allegiance and protection, Virginia has a duty to protect you, whether you're a citizen or not. If you're in Virginia, they have a duty to protect you against a rogue federal government. When the states adopted the Constitution, they didn't give up that responsibility to be faithful and loyal to you. And the duty is not to keep you safe, it's to keep you free. Our rights don't come from government, they come from God, from our Creator. We don't have a right to give them away. We don't have a right to let someone else take them away. We have an active responsibility to defend our God-given inalienable rights. I hear this argument often posed um, as, should we do nullification or should we do an Article 5 convention? And I say neither. <clears throat> the duty is to interpose, to stand between. The founders used the term interpose as opposed to nullify 25 times to one in the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions. I'm not referring to the draft. Kentucky, uh, a lot of folks like to refer to Jefferson saying that nullification was the rightful remedy, but that was in the, in the draft of the 1798 uh, Kentucky Resolution. If you look in the 85 essays of the Federalist Papers and in the, <coughs> excuse me, in the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions and, and even Madison's report, uh, 1800 report, you'll find the word nullification used one time in its past tense. You'll find variations of the word interpose or interposition 25 times. So where is the duty? Is it to say that's wrong, that's unconstitutional? Well, if it's a conflict between the federal government and the state, maybe so. But if, it, if, it's, if it's a conflict between the federal government and we the people, Virginia has a duty to interpose, to step in between we the people and a rogue federal government. When I hear the folks talk about, and, and Mr. Kelly's organization is uh, really good at this, putting all the blame on the federal government. When our general counsel debated their uh, Kansas uh, convention of states director, uh, he, he went so far, Mr. Snyder, nice gentleman, went so far as to say that we have we like good people when they get to Washington, something happens to them. Do you believe that? Yep. I've been asking people this question for years, and you don't have to raise your hands, but how many articles are in the Constitution? If you don't know the, the answer to that, that simple question, the simplest of questions is, how many articles? You probably haven't spent enough time reading it. I'll tell you there's seven of them. You'll never forget this. God gave us one for every day of the week. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't know what your rights are, you're not going to know when someone's abusing them. We do a sorry job of vetting candidates. We do a sorry job of holding those public officials accountable to that oath. And then we reward that bad behavior. We're enablers. We reward that bad behavior by reelecting them. The incumbency re-election rate depending on where you look in the country, is in, a, in the, the high 80s to mid 90%. And everybody says, well, we need, we need term limits. I brought some carrots today. These, <laughs> these are the only carrots that I'm going to dangle in front of you today. <laughs> and they're not my carrots. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the uh, Article 5 application that the Convention of States is promoting, or any of the others, they dangle a balanced budget amendment carrot. There's a term limits carrot. 
there's a, a, rain, a rain in the power of the federal government carrot. They also don't talk much about what the other side of the aisle, the proverbial aisle, is talking about. And I've got, I brought those up here. I was really expecting to be seated today, so I'm going to move on out a little bit. Uh, you know, folks are familiar with Mr. Soros, George Soros. Well, th there are, I printed a list out. I was going to post them up for you. Uh, I'll, I'll leave them over here so you can look at them. Over 350 organizations that are supporting move2amend.org. They've got some very interesting amendments that they would like to, to propose. I would suggest to you that the problem isn't the Constitution. The problem is we the people. If we won't elect public servants who will keep their oath now, what well, makes you think that once we amend the Constitution, that they're all of, gonna, all of a sudden going to have a come to Jesus moment and start keeping their oath? It will not happen. I'm not afraid of an Article 5 convention. I wish, th I wish the convention of states crowd would promote the rest of the Constitution. And Article 1, 2, 3, 4, 6. 7 a little moot at this point. That was the initial ratification method. Or adoption method of this Constitution. So we need to ask, ask ourselves some questions. Among those, what should be at the very front, oh, I had two carrots left. This is making the Affordable Care Act part of the Constitution, and this is to repeal the Second Amendment. And if you think that's alarming, Go look at the Hawaii application. Both of those things were in the draft. People from the left and the right have been trying to get their hands on the Constitution for nearly 100 years. They will dangle all sorts of carrots in front of you to get your support to trigger an Article 5 convention. I would concede that the convention and the rules and the procedure will go exactly as Mr. Kelly says. The Archangel Michael will be the chairman. All the delegates will be angels. They'll get every amendment they want. What will have changed in We the People? Madison <coughs> said that this form of government would only work for a moral and religious people. Seems like we've, we've lost our way in both of those categories. i ask you a question or two. How much time do I have left? Three minutes and 48 seconds. I better hustle on then. Madison said, and this is from Federalist 43, that Article 5 guards equally against that extreme facility which would render the Constitution too mutable and that extreme difficulty which might perpetrate its discovered faults. It moreover equally enables the general and the state governments to originate the amendment of errors. He didn't say anything about runaway, runaway federal government. And every indictment that you hear made against the federal government can be made against Richmond, and Raleigh, and your local governments as well. And eventually, we should find ourselves in front of the mirror, because that's who's responsible for the problem, and that's who's responsible for the solution. I can give, I'm not a lawyer, I am on our legal team. I can get a very litigious, just like Mr. Kelly, who is an attorney, can. But I think common sense can prevail. If people won't obey the Ten Commandments, would amending them be a remedy? <laughs> if your spouse is cheating on you, would you say, I need to amend my marriage vows? <laughs> That's going to get her in line or get him in line. It defies common sense. If public servants won't uphold the Constitution, why is amending it the solution? It simply isn't. Convention of States is just one organization. Now, on the back table, I've got our Article 5 resource sheets. You'll find probably more links to our opposition than you will to, our, to us, to people in the on the defense side of this argument. 
Uh, we're not afraid of their arguments. And we can shred them all, and we do. Depending on how much time we have. One, one of the things that's important to note, if you look at the Article 5 application that, that uh, Mr. Ferris, uh, Mr. Kelly's boss, has come up with, it's basically got five components to it. Now they call it a, <coughs> uh, they say that it's, it's limited, uh, they use the word limit in there twice to make you think it's a limited convention. But I would ask you, what was the purpose of our Constitution in the first place if it was not to establish the power and jurisdiction of the federal government? Right in the middle of their application is to limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government. That opens up every article to amendment. When those 360 folks in George Soros' camp get their hands on a convention, they're not gonna stay home. If it's sustainable development or equity, uh, socialist, fascist, I mean, all the worst things you hear that are, that are in opposition, if you say, if you claim to be a conservative or a constitutionalist, they're gonna be there too. And the, the safeguards that they propose, um, well, they're, they're about as safe as a padlock on a paper bag. They can make no promises that they can keep. There has never been an Article 5 convention, and it's certainly not time for one now. We need to defend, not amend, the Constitution. We need to identify the right problem before we start talking about solutions. Thank you. how to use this better than <laughs> bring any props, but I think yours are wonderful, so uh, I wish I had some more carrots to dangle in front of me. <laughs> it's all right. Um, so basically, if I, could, if I could summarize what Mr. Lewis has said to you, it's we should be defending the Constitution, not amending it. And my answer to that is, let's defend and amend the Constitution. Let's defend the Constitution. Yes, let's educate people about how the Constitution works, but let's actually put clear lines so that the people up in Washington, D.C., are forced to an outright confrontation with the text of the Constitution. You see, the problem that we have today is not that the people up in Washington disobey the Constitution. The problem we have with the people in Washington is that they obey the Constitution as interpreted by the Supreme Court. That's the problem. That's the problem we have up in Washington. The problem is that the Supreme Court has allowed Congress to do all sorts of things through the General Welfare Clause through the Commerce Clause. Those clauses, the Supreme Court has blown them up a hole so big, you could fit just about anything through them. That's basically what the Obamacare decision said. It said Congress can do just about anything it wants so long as it labels it a tax. That's basically what the Obamacare decision said. That's the problem right now. The problem isn't just that people need to be educated about the Constitution. It's that Congress needs to be held to clear, defined standards in the Constitution. The simple truth is the Commerce Clause could be written more tightly. It says that Congress shall have power to regulate interstate commerce. Unfortunately, it doesn't define what interstate commerce is. And what the Congress has done and what the Supreme Court has done is that anything that remotely attaches to a dollar sign is interstate commerce. Amendments can fix that. Amendments can change that. They can say interstate commerce is shipping goods across state lines. If it says that, then everything that has a dollar sign attached to it is no longer interstate commerce. So let's look historically, though. Let's look historically. Do amendments work? And the answer, if you look back on all 26 amendments to our United States Constitution, is resoundingly yes. Amendments do work. The Bill of Rights is still largely intact and largely effective to this day. The 11th Amendment was designed to reverse an erroneous Supreme Court decision in Chisholm versus Georgia. To this day, the Supreme Court has not gone back to the interpretation it took in Chisholm v. Georgia. That's because amendments do work. Amendments can work, and they have worked 
throughout our history. So yes, let's defend the Constitution. Let's educate people as to what it means. But let's hold Congress's feet to the fire. Let's give them a clear line and show how they've crossed it. Then we will be able to go to the people and say, they're violating, not just they're violating interstate commerce. They're saying that they can regulate everything in your life. And the Constitution says that's not true. So defend, yes, but amend, too. Mr. Lewis has made a lot about what the left would do if they could get their hands on a convention. He's pointed out that George Soros has some organizations that have advocated for an Article 5 convention. And of course the truth is Article 5 is neutral. It doesn't limit itself to just Republicans using it. It doesn't limit itself just to Democrats using it. It doesn't limit itself to Friends of the Constitution using it. Article 5 is neutral. But here's the point. You have to get through ratification. You have to get through ratification. You have to get 38 states to sign off on whatever amendments come out of that convention. So that means 13 states, one house, not just 13 states, but one house in 13 states can block any amendments. So let's look at the political composition of the legislature today. Let's put that 13 states figure in practical numbers. There are 26 states in the United States where both houses of the state legislature are solidly controlled by Republicans. 26 states. That's not counting Nebraska, which is technically nonpartisan and unicameral, but for all intents and purposes, it votes very conservative. Okay, 26 states. That means one house in one half of those 26 states would have to vote against an amendment to stop it. One house in one half of those conservative states would have to vote against it to stop it. So yeah, Article 5 is open for George Soros to use if he wants to hold his own convention under Article 5. But there is just no way he's ever going to get through ratification. It's just not going to happen. Nothing leaning to the left could possibly come out of this convention. So fears that that's what's going to happen, that the left is somehow going to commandeer this process, are just not practical realities given the political composition of the states today. And of course, that's exactly what the founders envisioned. That's exactly what they intended when they put such a high bar for ratification. They didn't want radical proposals getting through. They were masters of checks and balances. They voted unanimously to put Article 5 in the Constitution. I think they knew what they were doing. Now one thing uh, Mr. Lewis has pointed out is our application is fairly broad. It specifies three topics that the convention can consider. It can consider fiscal restraints on the federal government. It can consider items which limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government and it can consider term limits for federal officials. So that would be Congress, that would be members of the Supreme Court. And Mr. Lewis's argument against this is that it opens up all the articles. And that's true. It, well, not all the articles, as he pointed out, the seventh. But Article seven is kind of out of the picture here. Article six, not gonna really be touching that. But it does open up article one, dealing with Congress. Because guess what? Congress is part of the problem. It opens up article two. Why? Because the president is part of the problem. It opens up article three. Why? Because the Supreme Court is part of the problem. It allows us Article 5 to be considered so that the states don't have to go through this convoluted process in the future, so that if three quarters of the states agree in advance, they could propose amendments to the Constitution. It opens up these articles because the problem is not in an isolated single branch of the federal government. It's the President, it's the Supreme Court, and it's Congress. And if we limited ourselves to just touching one of those, we're not going to fix the problem. We're just going to shift the problem from Congress to now the president's just going to pass more executive orders doing whatever he wants. We're going to have more lawlessness. No, we need to address the problem as a whole. That's why our application is worded the way it is. That's why it's so broad. But I'll point out, it does have meaningful limits. Mr. Lewis said it doesn't have meaningful limits. It does. It's limited to limiting the government. And yes, I used the word limit there twice. It's limited to limiting the government. So it has a direction. It's like a one-way door. You can't expand the power of the government under our application, but you can limit it. That's what we want. That's how our application is limited. We want to see the federal government limited, not expanded. That's the heart of what Article 5 was designed to do. That's what George Mason said when he brought it up at the Constitutional Convention. Mr. Lewis has talked a lot about the concept of interposition. You know, how did the states interpose? And he says nullification isn't the right solution. Um, I don't know if nullification is the right solution. One thing I will say is we ought to probably be using the solutions that are given to us directly in the Constitution first. And that's Article 5. Interposition is the states 
interposing themselves into the process, reclaiming their power, pushing back against the federal government on that vertical balance of power. Article 5 is exactly how the states interpose themselves into the process. And actually, uh, James Madison wrote a letter saying exactly that. It was to John Everett in 1830. He wrote a letter, and he was talking, he used exactly the phrase interposition. And he was like, okay, so how, does the fed, how do the states interpose against the federal government? Well, they can refuse to let state officers enforce federal laws. That's one way. If that doesn't work, then what we have to do is we have to look to Article 5. That's what James Madison said. That's how the states interpose themselves. They go to Article 5. My question, my question for Mr. Lewis is, what's the alternative? What's the alternative? We've been talking about educating people for a, a long, long time. And we absolutely need to continue to do that. We absolutely need to educate people. We need to try and elect good politicians. But we need to stop putting all our eggs in Washington, D.C.'s basket. We really do. Because we're only drawing more attention to them. We're only solidifying their political power when we do that. We need to look at smart solutions. We need to work smart, not just work hard. And the way we do that is by looking at what the founders did. This wasn't something, Convention of States was not just a brilliant idea that occurred to a couple of constitutional law scholars last week. It's not something we made up. We saw exactly the same problem that you all see in the federal government. And what we did was we looked back at history. We looked back and we saw, well, how do we fix that? What, if we could bring James Madison here today, if we could bring George Mason here today, if we could bring George Washington here today, how would they tell us to get out of this huge imbalance of power that we have with the federal government? And the answer is there in history. It's there in the debates of the Constitutional Convention in 1787. It's there in the letters James Madison wrote to Thomas Jefferson in 1800. It's there in the letters George Washington wrote to his friends while he was president of the United States. They all said, look at Article 5. Look at Article 5. When the federal government gets too large, the states need to intervene. And the way the states intervene <coughs> is by using their power under the Constitution in Article 5 to make a difference. I'm getting better, yes. <laughs> How many minutes is this? 10 minutes of rebuttal. Oh, 10 minutes. Yes. <coughs> <laughs> there are 27 amendments, not 26. We'll start there. <laughs> Mr. Kelly says we shouldn't look, look to Washington. That's what his boss has done. HJR 50, House Joint Resolution 50. HJR 50, House Joint Resolution 50, is the Parental Rights Amendment. So what? Parental Rights Amendment. You can learn more about it at parentalrights.org. How many of you have kids? Please just direct your, your comments to the audience rather than interact with them. Okay. For those of you who have kids, do you want the government telling you how to raise your kids? Who, who has the ultimate responsibility to raise your kids? You do. Yet, HJR 50, the Parental Rights Amendment, which has been co-sponsored by dozens of members of Congress, but the Parental Rights Amendment sounds about as appealing as the Patriot Act, perhaps. Or National Defense Authorization Act sounds pretty uh, pretty cool, and yet they've got some serious problems with them. <coughs> you mentioned that uh, you know, limiting. Now you're an attorney. Lim to limit something is not necessarily to reduce it. To limit is just to put constraints on it. And those constraints that you come up with after you amend the, the Constitution could be broader than they are now. And under the Parental Rights Amendment, which Mr. Ferris has been championing, trying to get Congress to, to adopt for several Congresses now, it reads, neither the United States nor any state shall infringe these rights 
without demonstrating that its governmental interest is applied to the person is of the highest order and not otherwise served. Now, he sells this under the pretense to protect us against some UN treaty on the rights of the child. And yet, Article 6, Clause 2, the Supremacy Clause, says no law and no treaty that's in conflict with the Supremacy Clause, with the Constitution, is law. The framers said it. The court, Supreme Court's ruled over and over again. A law that's not written in pursuance of the Constitution is null as if it was never a law in the first place. That's the constitutional nullification that state and local government, everybody that takes an oath to support and defend the Constitution is sworn to, to protect whether anybody else does or not. Parental Rights Amendment, as long as the government demonstrates it has an interest of the highest order, all the warm fuzzy stuff he put in Section 1 and Section 2 go the way of the dodo. And it mirrors a lot of the language you'll find in the UN's uh, uh, Rights of the Child or some of their other garbage that takes our God-given rights and just makes it fundamental. And you say, what else can we do? Well, I can tell you what we're doing. And we have legislation, uh, H.R. 1888, and you don't have to pass it to find out what's in it. But this is designed to uphold Article 4, Section 4, which guarantees us protection against invasion. And America's been in the largest invasion in world history, and just since 9-11-2001, according to two congressional uh, GAO studies, we've lost over 100,000 people on American soil at the hands of illegal aliens. Mr. Kelly mentioned that we've got uh, 26 states that have a majority in both chambers. North Carolina has a supermajority of Republicans in the, the House and the Senate, in the governor's mansion, the lieutenant governor, and the North Carolina Supreme Court. They could wipe the slate on every progressive socialist agenda item and law that's been passed in the past 100 years if they wanted to. What they do about the 2012 National Defense Authorization Act? which violates no fewer than 14 provisions of the Constitution, including over half of the Bill of Rights, declares the whole world a battlefield, including the homeland. What did they do? What did Richmond do? Well, Richmond passed HB 1160, what I call the Warm Fuzzy Act, which basically said, don't help them. Is that fulfilling Richmond's duty? Most of these conservative Republican legislatures won't even drop a note in the, in the king's complaint box and say, that's wrong. When their duty is to interpose, their duty is to put their foot down and say, this is unconstitutional, you will not do it here in my state. They don't have the backbone for it. And why don't they? Because we don't. This is a 15 page model resolution for Virginia that explains line by line, the, all the gory details you want to know about what's wrong with the National Defense Authorization Act. And if that was too much to read, we came up with a shorter version. It's like four pages long. And if that wasn't short enough, the model legislation is one page that declares it unconstitutional and says it's unlawful for anybody to do the things that sections 1021 and 1022 and by extension, the 2001 authorization for use of military force authorizes. Um, I'm gonna leave these with, with Kerry, but between the US Constitution and Virginia's Constitution, these are the violations in the NDAA that it authorizes. We have model legislation for Congress on this issue, for your city and county governments, for your sheriff. We don't have one yet for the dog catcher, but if you have a dog catcher that wants to take a stand, we'll write you one. And we have a model resolution that says we should defend the Constitution, not amend it. Constitution is not the problem. Amending it is not the solution. So I left anything else out here. Oh, he, he named one amendment in the past 100 years 
in your heads. <laughs> that restored personal liberty or defended personal right. The only one that, that he can refer to, and I think it was about 95 years ago, was suffrage. Or perhaps the torn to repeal of the 18th Amendment. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> I don't see, as uh, Phil Slapley from Eagle Forum says, I don't see very many James Madison's, George Mason's, Thomas Jefferson's in the political climate today. I don't trust them. I can't trust, it's like asking the fox to, uh, the, to hand over his duties to the wolf to watch the hen house by asking state legislatures and political parties to pick the delegates, to write the amendments, to change a document that they won't uphold now. It's insanity. Common sense says if they won't uphold it now, well, what makes you think they're going to do it after you amend it? They won't. Closing statements by each side, and uh, before I ask Mr. Kelly to begin, uh, I'm going to ask my friend Dave Dietrich to uh, stand ready with these. Uh, this is just a little informal poll uh, at the conclusion of the debate, uh, give you an opportunity to say whether your opinion has been changed or not by what you've heard today. So I'll ask Dave to pass those out immediately when, the, when uh, Mr. Lewis is finished with his closing statement. All right, well, thank you all for being through this entire debate. I just want to run down through the last couple of issues and then put a bow on this, so to speak, and wrap up why I think Article 5 is the correct solution to the problem we face with massive federal overreach today. Now, Mr. Lewis has raised a couple different points here. He pointed out towards the very end there that no amendments in the last 100 years have restored individual rights. Well, I would like to point out that that's exactly the point we would like to make. You know why no amendments since, in fact, I will go even farther than that. No amendments since the Bill of Rights, said maybe the 21st, no amendments since the Bill of Rights have ever taken away power from Congress. Why? George Mason told us why in the constitutional debate of 1787. Because Congress was the one proposing all the amendments. Every single amendment we have in the Constitution right now, every single one was written by Congress. So it shouldn't come as a shock to us that they don't take power away from Congress. That's exactly why we need to use a convention of states, so that we can have another body proposing amendments to the Constitution. Congress isn't going to put a limit on itself. It's never going to put limits on itself. American history is proof that it will not do that. It has not done it for 200 years. But the states, the states can put limits on Congress. Now, Mr. Lewis has also argued a lot about how the states are not perfect. They're part of the problem. And of course, that's true. And if we're waiting around, for perfect politicians on either the state or the federal level, we're going to be waiting around for a very long time. But the vision of the founders wasn't we were going to have perfect people in the states checking in perfect people in the federal government. The vision of the founders, the way James Madison put it in the Federalist Papers, was we need to have ambition checking ambition. We need scumbag politicians in the states checking scumbag politicians in Washington, D.C. It's not perfect politicians checking bad politicians. It's bad politicians down here checking bad politicians up here. The reason our system is breaking down is not that we have bad politicians. Our system was designed to work with bad politicians, and it's done a pretty good job for most of our 200-year history. The reason it's breaking down is because the federal government has all the power, so the scumbags up there can do whatever they want, and the scumbags down in the states can't do anything to stop them. That's why we need to use Article 5. Even if everything we're trying to do with Article 5 fails, even if all we get out of an Article 5 convention is some balanced budget amendment that Congress can weasel around, it will have had the states reasserting their power. We get to 32 states applying for a convention, Congress is going to be shaking in its boots because its power is going to have a real challenge for the first time perhaps in American history. That's the beauty of a convention of states. That's how we get a balance of power restored in our country. 
one of the other one of the other things that Mr. Lewis brought up was we don't see many Madisons today. We don't see many Jeffersons today. I think they would have been the first to admit they were not perfect. I mean, you look back at the founding era of politics, and it was as dirty as any politics today. I mean, if you look at the 1800 election when Thomas Jefferson became the third, or third, excuse me, third president of the United States. <laughs> In that election, John Adams had people running around telling Jefferson's friends that he was dead, so that they wouldn't vote for him. I mean, that's how bad politics was back around the founding. They would have been the first to admit they were not perfect politicians. You see, we don't need perfect politicians. We don't need even Madisons or Hamiltons to be at this convention. We need the states to be involved. We need the states to start pushing back against the federal government. That's what it takes the states to push back, to reclaim just a little bit of the heritage they have under the Constitution. At the beginning of this debate, I said it basically comes down to one issue. Do we trust the Constitution, the whole Constitution as written by the founders, or are we going to distrust Article 5 because we're afraid of the power that our own Constitution gives to us? That's the question. Do we trust what the founders gave us in the Constitution? I think we do. I think we can. I think we need to do it if we want to have a realistic shot of turning around the direction of this country. Now, I gave you three criteria at the beginning of this debate. Does it address the right problem? How risky is it? And how effective is it? Mr. Lewis, I, I haven't really heard anything that, that answers those questions. How do we fix this imbalance of power? We know from the founders, they thought Article 5 was the way we fix this balance of power. They knew it was dangerous. They knew it was a powerful tool because, of course, to check Congress, you've got to have a powerful tool. But like any powerful tool, founders were masters of checks and balances, and they put checks and balances in place. This is a safe process. This is the process designed by the founders for this exact circumstance. And I encourage you to stand with me in using the full Constitution as written by the founders. Mr. Lewis. Newsflash, the states already have everything they need in the Constitution. Well, we, we, if, if the states really wanted, and we've identified over 100 different amendments, some from the left, some from the right, that are, that are under consideration. Um, some of those carrots, I didn't want to bring a bushel basket of carrots in here. Um, <clears throat> The Second Amendment where it says the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, how more simply can you put that? And we mean it this time? We got, do we just need to do an amendment that says Congress must uphold the Constitution and we mean it this time? Until we mean it, it doesn't matter what's on that paper if we don't mean it. If we're not willing to do like the founders in the last line of the Declaration of Independence, what did they pledge? their lives, their fortunes, their sacred honor. Until we the people are willing to stand up and demand, I don't go to see my congressman or my senator or governor wringing my hands saying, oh, please do your job. This is the employee handbook and I'm an employer. I demand that they do their job. I don't, there's, I don't take excuses. And, and we have to stop taking excuses. We should, we should defend and amend? That's crazy talk. Um, <clears throat> Thomas Jefferson in 1823 said, on every question of construction of the Constitution, let us carry ourselves back to the time when the Constitution was adopted. Recollect the, recollect the spirit manifested in the debates, and instead of trying what meaning may be squeezed out of the text or intended against it, conform to the probable one in which it was passed. Words have meaning. If they're gonna shift and change with the wind, I believe it was either Jefferson or, or Franklin that said, it could have been Madison, I'll, I'll get those three mixed up because they're all really cool. Uh, said it, in matters of fashion or matters of style, sway like the wind. In matters of principle, stand like a rock. We have to stand like a rock and demand that the supreme law of the land is supreme and that it's upheld. 
Governor Zebulon Baird Vance from North Carolina said in 1876, when you find you have scoundrels and scallywags in office, you need to turn them out. And you need to keep turning them out until you send honorable men to Washington. That applies to every level of government. And until we do that, no amendment's gonna change anything. And an Article 5 convention is like playing Russian roulette, except instead of only one bullet chambered, there's only one chamber empty. Are you willing to risk your individual liberties your God-given rights at an Article 5 convention. Jordan Seilers of the uh, Convention of the States, our communications director, said, I think the majority of Americans are too lazy to elect honest politicians, but I think some men and women could be found who are morally and intellectually capable of rewriting the Constitution. There is nobody alive today that I trust to rewrite the Constitution. Mr. Kelly has admitted that their application opens up the whole thing to amendment. Warm, fuzzy solutions, identifying the wrong problem, and then applying a solution that won't solve the problem, the root problem. Thoreau said there's a, there's a thousand lacking at the limbs of evil to one chopping at the root. We need to chop at the root of the problem, and it's in the mirror. It's not in the Constitution. When Mr. Kelly was referencing what the president was doing wrong, or Congress was doing wrong, or the courts were doing wrong, he never mentioned that this was wrong. It's the people. It's not the document. Fix the people, uphold the Constitution, and 90% of our problems will, will fix themselves. We have a ton of information, because this was a short, uh, a, a short venue. Uh, please visit the Patriot Coalition at PatriotCoalition.com, our project that deals specifically with this issue, DefendNotAmend.com. The resource sheet on the back, pa back table is only one page. The link at the very bottom of it is to the complete document. Thank you very much. Make informed decisions. Thank you. Uh, that was neat. And I've, I want to thank both of my speakers for uh, coming long distance in both cases to uh, present this material to you today.